Uh, so to get started um, about us, my name is Jeff Zimrick. Uh, I'm an engineer at Open Source Connections, um, and uh, I'm the current chair of the Apache Open NLP project and a member of the Apache Software Foundation. Uh, in a previous life, I was primarily cloud engineer on AWS and uh, GCP. Uh, Open Source Connections is uh, sponsoring uh, Berlin Buzzwords, and so please stop by in the partner booth. Um, and we're also hiring, so if you like search and you like this kind of stuff, um, please definitely stop by. Uh, you can always get in touch with me at email um, or join the relevancy Slack. I'm always available there as well. David? Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is David Smithbauer. I'm uh, excited to be here with all of you today. Appreciate the opportunity. Um, I'm an engineer with Lidos, uh, specifically, uh, I guess, in the last few years, specifically related to DevOps, um, fan of Kubernetes, containerization, uh, all things DevOps. So um, again, thanks for, for being here for the talk. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Jeff? Cool, thanks. Uh, so introduction of what our talk is about. I know it had a lot of words in the title um, and being you know buzzwords, Berlin buzzwords, had to make a lot of buzzwords in there. Uh, but what we want to show is an illustration of, of how we can make a, a containerized system um, that's uh, ML stuff, how it can evolve over time, um, and how we can monitor it to increase performance and relevance. Uh, this isn't intended to be a uh, how-to guide for one specific tool. Um, it's intended more to illustrate the underlying concepts. So then you can take those away. And if you want to use a tool, if you want to roll your own stuff, um, you're, you're free to make that choice uh, on its own. And we also want to describe MLOps, um, what it is, uh, the problem it's trying to solve, and the challenges that it brings along with it. So what is MLOps? Uh, we see it all the time, pretty much in, uh, I would say, you know, 90 percent of the, uh, the blog posts that come out. There, there's some mention to MLOps. Um, and it, at its heart, it's intended to be the intersection of DevOps and machine learning. Uh, so we're taking the uh, successful parts of DevOps over the past few years, um, and we're trying to apply those to machine learning concept. Uh, the ultimate goal uh, for MLOps is to get a model into production. Um, simple as that said, but not as simple as that done. Uh, so we want to um, increase our automation. Um, we want to apply you know, software development lifecycle, uh, CICD, uh, all those best practices um, from DevOps over to uh, MLOps. Uh, so first thing about um, AI, ML, if you've done any, or if you haven't, if you just read, or if you're a beginner or a seasoned veteran, um, you're probably aware that things are easy to deploy, um, but very hard to maintain. Uh, it uh, has become in the past few years uh, the NLP, AI, and other areas, um, the technology has become so democratized that uh, the learning curve uh, to get something running, to get something usable, uh, is small, and that's absolutely wonderful. Um, but the part that we can't ignore is how to maintain it uh, once we have something that we think works. Um, and so when we try to apply MLOps uh, to this, we realize that things are all of a sudden more complex because now we're not just dealing with DevOps issues, we also have ML issues um, that come into play as well. Uh, and so some of these are like DevOps issues, uh, and some of them are issues on their own. Uh, for example, uh, treatment of models as black boxes. Uh, for the coders out there, uh, you know, when you get something that works, um, maybe you wrote it, maybe someone else wrote it, maybe you don't know who wrote it. Uh, but you know it works, uh, it takes some input, it takes some output, um, and you're tasked with plugging that into your system. Um, and we know that the code that we write on the, uh, the input and the code that we write on the output, uh, it doesn't take real long for it to become glue. <laughs> and um, uh, it becomes hard to maintain, um, and uh, it can turn into a disaster quickly. And uh, with uh, machine learning models, um, the treatment of those as black boxes is, is, is even more uh, common because it's it's hard to see how an ML model is, is working. Uh, changes in the data. Um, you know, we make a model today on data that we have today, and it works great. Um, uh, and so we deploy it, and we, we put it to use. Uh, and what we sometimes don't think about is um, what happens to that data tomorrow. 
Uh, will that data be the same? Will the data change? Maybe we don't know. Uh, so we have to keep in mind that uh, everything is, is changing all the time. Um, and another good example is that good software engineering practices don't always apply. Um, we were taught in pretty much all of our software engineering courses about uh, design patterns um, and abstraction uh, and trying to apply those to uh, ML models uh, can be difficult or near impossible uh, to implement some sort of abstraction in a, in a machine learning model uh, for reusability uh, can be a, a task on its own. Um, and these issues, along with others, um, come from a 2015 paper uh, cited at the bottom uh, titled Hidden Technical Debt in Machine Learning Systems. Um, it's a very interesting read, especially when you think that it was written six years ago. Um, maybe things have just changed in that time period, or maybe the paper was a little ahead of itself. Uh, but uh, reading it today, um, it, it definitely brings to light issues uh, that are certainly still there. So it's a very good read. Uh, so like software engineering, as we develop code, we develop models, we get technical debt. Um, and so this is another area uh, in which we need to um, be aware of when we're doing or trying to apply our ML ops. Uh, the first one is entanglement. Everything is um, somehow connected. And we have the phrase, changing anything changes everything. Uh, nothing is independent. Um, so you can imagine in an ML ops pipeline um, that's doing uh, ETL or, or some other type of data processing, um, one change somewhere is going to change everything. Um, or uh, if you're creating your ML model, uh, changing your hyperparameters, changing your features, um, it may seem like an innocuous change, uh, but uh, the impacts of that change can be extremely dramatic. Uh, pipeline management itself, um, you know, ETL is uh, three short little letters, um, but uh, it's uh, a daunting task in itself. Um, and so it's easy to acquire technical debt around your ETL pipeline. Uh, hidden feedback loops, um, such as uh, uh, different models or different services can unknowingly interact with each other um, and affect uh, the, the operation of each other. And these things that may not be obvious immediately may, may only come after uh, months or, or years of use before you realize it. Um, and, and so <laughs> we can't really apply the, the Marie Kondo approach of uh, does it bring you joy if not throw it out? Otherwise, we would just throw out all of our te technical debt uh, forever. Uh, so a spoiler there, um, don't throw out your technical debt. We have to address it. Um, and so uh, machine learning brings its own technical debt that we have to address just as we would um, from software development. So back to ML ops. Um, lots of AI projects don't make it into production. If you try to Google that and find statistics, uh, you'll see anywhere, some studies say 53% up to 87% of AI projects don't make it into production. Um, and whatever those reasons are, it varies. Um, but we can take away from that number that that's a decent amount of projects. So um, the, the ones that fail for technical reasons, uh, ML Ops is, is trying to put standard as ways around those projects to help make them more successful. Um, and uh, an example of that was Kubeflow uh, that started in 2018. Um, and there's eight areas uh, known together as the big eight areas, uh, data collection, data processing, feature engineering, data labeling, model design, model training, model optimization, and deployment and monitoring. So these are the eight areas that MLOps uh, tries to address. And uh, if you're like me and you say, oh, hey, you know, it can't be that bad, but then you look and, and you know, for example, deployment monitoring, um, that is um, a lot more than just three words. Uh, there's a lot that goes into that. Um, and so each of those areas. So uh, ML ops uh, becomes a broad and, and daunting task to, to address those eight. So for our project here to illustrate some of this, uh, what we want to build is we're going to build a ML powered system that uses trending hashtags from Twitter um, to influence our search results. Uh, so we are going to monitor Twitter hashtags um, and we are going to use those hashtags um, and our naive algorithm to determine what's trending um, to influence our search results. So in, in this example here, um, you can see I have a Christmas tree there on, on my movie. So um, at the end, what we want to do is uh, if we search for, say, family movies uh, at Christmas, if Christmas is a trending hashtag, um, then our, our search results will be influenced by those trending hashtags. 
Uh, so here's some example search results uh, to help illustrate it a little bit better, a little more concrete. Uh, so on the left-hand side is uh, 10 movies um, that uh, were retrieved from a search index uh, that was um, that contained the TMDB uh, data set, a subset of the data set. Um, and so index these uh, movie documents into uh, the uh, index and uh, then just ran a family search. And these are the, the movies that came back. And so on the right side is where we want to get. So let's say that the hashtag Christmas is trending uh, and we do that search now. Uh, then as you can see, we get um, 10 uh, family uh, movies that in some way deal with Christmas, whether it's uh, at Christmas time uh, or, or some, uh, somehow other closely related to Christmas. Uh, so the components of our uh, system um, is going to be a consumer um, to read tweets from Twitter and collect those hashtags. Uh, and for that, we're going to use an Apache Flink application. Uh, and uh, we're going to index our movies uh, into Elasticsearch. Uh, what search engine you use doesn't matter. I know uh, concurrently there's a debate going on uh, in one of the other uh, Berlin Buzzwords rooms between uh, Elasticsearch, Solar, uh, and Vespa. Um, so uh, and, you know, what you want to use is up to you. This this example doesn't dictate uh, any of that. Uh, we're going to use a natural language classifier. Uh, it's a zero shot learning classifier uh, to be able to um, assign our movies to categories. Uh, and the categories are the hashtags. And we're going to use part of Kubeflow uh, to help with that. Uh, to be able to gauge our um, search results, we're going to use Cupid, um, which I know I've heard referenced a few times throughout the conference. Uh, it's a a tool to uh, to do judgments on search results. And we have to store everything. So we're going to use MySQL uh, and a Redis cache just to make everything available. Uh, so the architecture diagram of this, um, to give you a better idea, uh, is we have our tweets that come in. Um, we have our stream consumer, our Flink application. Um, and then from those tweets, it pulls out hashtags. Um, and I said before, our, our trending hashtag algorithm is, is rather naive. Uh, it simply counts them and uh, orders them from uh, most to least. Um, and so whatever is most, uh, we call it as trending. Um, and whatever is least is not trending. Um, and we pass those hashtags along with uh, movie summaries to our classifier. Um, and that tells us uh, some probability that that movie has something uh, to do with that hashtag, for example, Christmas. And so then a user can execute their search against the search engine um, and get those ranked movie results back uh, influenced by the trending hashtags. Uh, so the data set, uh, to describe it, it's a subset of listing of movies. Um, it has a whole bunch of fields. Uh, this is just a few uh, to give you an idea. Um, to, so for each movie, it lists the genres, the language, the title, the overview. Um, and I did Die Hard here uh, because I think we all agree that Die Hard is a Christmas movie. Um, but so I had to include that one. Um, and so it's uh, in JSON, so it's easy to, uh, to get and uh, index. Our stream consumer, um, as I think I said before, just a flink job. Uh, it just maintains a map of hashtags to their count of occurrences. Um, as it accumulates this map, it persists them to Redis. Uh, so that way we can easily pull out what we want uh, and we can sort it. Uh, so uh, it, it's not very smart per se. Um, and so it, uh, it, it just works on raw hashtags. Um, in the real world, uh, you might want to do some manipulation of the hashtags since sometimes they're not all nice, friendly words like Christmas. Uh, could be other things. Uh, so how do we classify those movies uh, based on some hashtag uh, that comes through? Um, if, when you think about it, uh, the problem that comes to mind first is we don't know what's going to be trending tomorrow. Uh, we don't even know what's going to be trending later today. Uh, in 2019, um, before December, we did not have any idea that pandemic was going to be more than trending in 2020. Uh, so uh, how can we classify those movies based on labels that we don't know? It's really hard to, to train some type of classification model uh, with labels that we don't know. Uh, if we had some predefined set of categories, um, sure, we can do that. But without those labels, it becomes more difficult. So we need something else. Um, and for that, we're going to uh, use a zero shot classifier uh, to do it. Um, so a zero shot classifier is built on top of natural language inference, uh, NLI. 
Um, and it's a type of NL NLP task um, where given a premise, uh, some sentence, um, and another sentence, which is the hypothesis, determine the relationship between those two sentences. Um, and the relationship uh, could be entailment, contradiction, or neutral. Um, this task is sometimes referred to as recognizing textual entailment, RTE. Uh, so if you see that, it's referring to the same thing. So in the examples here, um, the premise, a soccer game with multiple males playing, given a hypothesis, some men are playing a sport, uh, then we would label those as being true uh, in Telma, um, versus the other example where a man inspects the uniform of a figure in some East Asian country, and the hypothesis the man is sleeping. Those are co contradiction, uh, so we label them uh, as such. Uh, so the training data uh, that's used for this model is just that data. Um, sentence pairs along with um, a label for entailment, contradiction, or neutral. Uh, so in this example, we have our premise, we have our hypothesis, uh, and we have our label. Uh, in the Hugging Face ecosystem, uh, there are several uh, NLI data sets uh, available for training on your own models. Um, this example uh, was taken from SNLI. Uh, so if you go on the Hugging Face dataset website and search for NLI, uh, you can find this data set and others uh, to train your own models with. Uh, so using this model as a zero-shot learning classifier, uh, we want to be able to classify our text, which is our movie summaries, into one or more categories. Um, and like I said before, we don't know what those categories are going to be because hashtags just come and go. Um, and to step back a little bit, um, in just an illustration of transfer learning versus zero shot learning, um, we hear a lot about uh, BERT and, and transformers about fine tuning our models. Um, so the illustration uh, in the bottom corner down there is the difference between using a pre-trained model versus a zero shot model, uh, where you do your fine tuning for some tasks such as sentiment uh, uh, analysis uh, versus a zero shot model uh, where we have our model and we just throw text at it, direct use of it. So classifying our movie overviews, uh, the hypothesis that we have is this text is about blank. Um, and so we are going to take our sequence, which is our movie overview, and our candidate labels, which are our hashtags. Um, so for each uh, candidate label that we get it, our model will say this text is about hashtag one. This text is about hashtag two. Uh, and each time it does that, it gets back a probability, uh, somewhere between zero and one, that indicates the model's uh, belief that this text uh, can be classified as that category. Uh, so if you're doing multi-class classification, it'll be between, each one will be between zero uh, and one. Or if we're just doing single class, um, the probabilities will sum up to one. So using the model, um, we are just going to take uh, each movie summary and we are going to take trending hashtags um, and we are going to throw them at the classifier. Um, and uh, see in a little bit that we just kind of wrap the classifier as a rest service um, to be able to take that text uh, and return back uh, some numeric probabilities for us. And then we can use those fields uh, in our sorting. Uh, model training, um, use the Hugging Face Transformers. Uh, it makes it really easy uh, to do, uh, really available. Uh, we use DVC uh, to store our models along with our source code. Uh, so one of those things where applying uh, DevOps to MLOps uh, is a way to have everything under source control. Um, and so DVC, uh, which I have a slide on next, I think, is a real good way uh, to be able to do that. Um, everything runs in containers, so we can deploy it uh, to our cluster or run it locally or wherever uh, that we need to. So model versioning with DVC. Um, uh, so DVC is a really good tool, if you're not familiar with it, uh, to be able to capture um, artifacts like models uh, into uh, Git repository. Um, so it stores the metadata about the files in Git while pushes the actual models, which can be many gigs in size, of course, uh, to some backend, uh, whether it's S3 um, or to an SSH uh, file share, NFS, or some other place. Uh, so you can do git push and git pull um, and get your models and, and persist your models right along the source code. So whatever code or data that you use to train your model, um, you can now have it uh, right there with the model uh, itself. 
Uh, so evaluating the model. So after we make a model, we, we need to know how well um, it's working. Um, there's two bullet points, trends come and go and new movie releases. Uh, you put those together and we end up with a stale model. Uh, that's probably not going to do what it needs to do um, a few days, months, or, or years from now. So we, we have to keep improving it over time. Um, and we have to have a way to be able to um, judge the performance of our model. Uh, one way to do that is to use human judgments of movies against a few categories. So uh, in that example search I had at the beginning, uh, you can go through and you can score each result um, as uh, somewhere between one and four of, of how good of a search result it is. Uh, you, can, you can save those judgments um, and you can compare them uh, to judgments uh, and search results using your model. Um, how well does it perform? Is it better than human judgment? Is it worse? You know, how, how does it compare to our human judgments? Um, and so that can give us a baseline performance uh, going forward. So as we evaluate new models, um, we can uh, test them against our human judgments as well and hopefully see uh, some improvement uh, from our last one. And this is where we use the Cupid tool uh, to, to make those judgments. So here's an example um, of our human judge movies on the left. Uh, uh, most Christmas shows there are very much about Christmas. Um, the ones that we gave three to two are only a little bit about Christmas, so they take place during Christmas time. Um, and the movies on the right, um, uh, I uh, took some liberty there on, on some of those Christmas movies uh, just to illustrate the point a little bit more. Um, Predator certainly did not come back as a search result, but uh, uh, you, you can give it a zero as it has nothing to do with Christmas. Uh, same as Die Hard. Um, it only takes place during Christmas. It's not actually about Christmas. Um, and so those uh, judgments um, are less than the ones on the right. So as our model improves, then uh, we hope that our scores of our search results uh, on the right uh, would show improvement um, over time. Uh, so deploying our model, um, use KF serving. Um, it's part of the Kubeflow package. Um, and KF serving is really nice because it encapsulates a lot of stuff that you normally have to write yourself. Uh, so, for example, you could certainly take your model and wrap your own REST service around it um, in, in just a couple of hours and call yourself done and deploy it. Um, but you're missing out on some of the stuff that KF serving gives you, uh, such as uh, auto scaling, networking, health checks, uh, and so on. Uh, so, just by uh, using KF serving, uh, you can have all that available to you. Uh, and once you do, it becomes available, your model becomes available for inference over a REST API. Uh, so using a curl uh, command, such as the example shown, uh, we can um, send um, sentences and, uh, and labels over to the model uh, and get the output uh, pretty easily. The model itself, um, use a DVC uh, for training um, at production time. You, you can keep using DVC. You can also use the new Hugging Face Model Hub. Uh, you can persist it up there and, and just pull it automatically uh, if you choose. Uh, so once you're, you're good, uh, a new classifier, it's, it's ready to be used. Uh, so a little bit more about KF serving um, briefly. Um, just a, a model inference on Kubernetes supports a lot of ML frameworks, um, regardless of what you use. Um, and you can use a custom Docker image. Uh, so you can use pretty much any type of model as long as you implement uh, the interface. Uh, and here is an example um, of the interface that you implement uh, for KF serving. Uh, so you just implement the init, the load, and predict functions um, inside your Python class. So uh, your init just sets stuff up uh, and load, load your model, uh, and predict is where uh, the uh, the REST service uh, uh, grabs your input uh, and does whatever you need to do. Uh, so simply by implementing those functions, uh, you get to take advantage of everything that KF Serving gives you. Uh, deploying with KF Serving, uh, there's custom resource in Kubernetes. Um, and so you can just define your image um, using the resource and you can uh, uh, just deploy it uh, to Kubernetes without uh, much trouble. Uh, so um, just like with DevOps, MLOps requires monitoring. Uh, we need to be able to monitor pretty much everything all the time. Um, and so MLOps is no different. At, at training time, um, you need to capture the metrics that, that go along with the model. Um, and uh, deployment, uh, how well is the model performing? Uh, is it responsive? Um, uh, our, in, in this case, our inference is not done at search time. It's done um, when we update our index. 
Um, so that's a little bit better, but still inference time is important to, to cut down on, on the, uh, the time. Um, and the effectiveness, um, monitor our click results on our search page uh, to make sure that, um, uh, that the search results that the users are getting back are what they expect, what they're looking for. Um, if people are continually going to page two and three, uh, then maybe we're not doing as good as we should. Our model needs improved uh, uh, some. So uh, important to, just like DevOps, to monitor everything that we can. Uh, all of this code um, is up on my GitHub uh, under the Berlin Buzzwords repo. Um, it, it, it all runs um, and works uh, to give you an idea of how things are set up. So feel free to clone that uh, project. Um, just follow the steps in the readme. Um, and you can run each component using Docker Compose if you wish for simplicity. Um, but you can set it up to uh, consume tweets and, and grab hashtags, um, in, index the movies, um, uh, throw the movies at the classifier, uh, and then do a search um, and, and see how the results are based on some um, hashtags. And, and you can also short circuit a little bit um, in the hashtags to to make your own hashtags if you want to cut down on, on the time it takes just to uh, experiment with it. Uh, so please feel free to uh, give it a go. Um, so uh, if you're familiar with Kubeflow, your, your one question you probably says, why not just use more of Kubeflow? Um, and short answer is you totally could. Uh, it is a bit heavier um, on things. And it does have a little more of a learning curve. Uh, if you already have ML pipelines in production, or, or you're experimenting with them and you're going to have multiple, uh, then you probably should. Uh, you, rather than managing everything one off, uh, using Kubeflow to do all of those uh, is probably your best bet. And again, this presentation was more uh, designed to uh, show principles. Uh, so now that we have this knowledge with, with what we need from MLOps, um, we can look at Kubeflow or some other um, orchestration framework to see if it's what we need. Uh, so summary, uh, to summarize, um, ML ops may just be thought of as applying DevOps um, to machine learning, but uh, it's not all that it is. It brings a lot of new challenges. Um, we have to address our ML tech debt. We can't just say it doesn't bring us joy, throw it away. Uh, there's a, another paper by the, the previous authors uh, called Machine Learning, the High Interest Credit Card Technical Debt from 2014. Uh, again, it's a very good read for insight uh, into how we must uh, manage ML tech debt. Uh, a zero-shot classifier is a wonderful tool um, to help us label text uh, for categories that were not known at training time. Uh, has a lot of use cases, um, and I think uh, uh, will be probably widely used uh, going forward. Um, KF serving makes life easy to, to deploy models to Kubernetes, even without using all of Kubeflow. Um, and so with a lot of care, we can get an ML project to production. Uh, we can hopefully increase those percentages of projects that go from uh, dev or experiment to, to get them into uh, production. Um, and lastly, we just need to look at the whole um, ML project ecosystem holistically. Uh, remember that everything affects everything else. Uh, data today may not be data tomorrow. Uh, so just uh, take the 10,000 foot uh, view approach uh, when working on it. Uh, lastly, thank you. Um, uh, again, uh, really happy to be here uh, presenting uh, at Berlin Buzzwords. Um, if you're working on something similar, uh, love to hear about it. Uh, join, uh, I'm on the relevant Slack. Just look me up there um, or, or email either way. Um, and uh, thanks again. Thanks for that, Jeff. Uh, that was a lot of content. I really, really enjoyed listening to that. I don't see any questions coming in from our viewers, um, but I have one um, if we have a few moments, which I think we, we're short on time, but um, how would you uh, incorporate A-B testing, experimentation, segmentation, all of those um, kind of fun things about ML? Um, what's, what's the approach and how does that in get included into into all of this ML ops? Sure, yeah, great question. Um, with the system like we did, um, you, you, it, the, the AB part, uh, you, you can really just kind of apply um, how you would typically do AB a testing. Um, and so this one, with your search results and, and your classifier, you, you don't want to make changes to your index uh, on the fly with people are using. So you kind of need a separate system 
uh, to test stuff there. And for AB on your, on your search results, uh, you know, you can uh, apply uh, different um, metrics or, or capture, you, know, you don't have to make it available to everyone at the same time. You can roll it out slowly uh, or however you need to uh, based on your demographics or, or uh, to try to measure uh, results that way. And I'll jump in here too. I think um, Jeff mentioned the KF serving, right? So we can utilize some of the capabilities inherent to Kubernetes as well. As we uh, serve up those models using KF serving and put them into the cluster, right? We can use some of the other mechanisms that are there and approaches with Kubernetes as far as being able to route percentages of traffic to different models that are being served by, you know, using KF serving to serve those up in the Kubernetes environment and route percentages of traffic that way too. Yeah.